Hi, good morning from Canberra. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, my name is Samantha Hoffman. I'm a senior analyst at ASPE's International Cyber Policy Center and will be moderating today's discussion. Uh, we're a large center in ASPE that works across cyber technology and information issues, and we have about a half dozen different areas of specialty, one of those being in-depth China-focused research. We're here today to launch our latest report, The Flip Side of China's Central Bank Digital Currency, which has chapters written by a range of Australian and international ex uh, uh, specialists. Um, there is a growing global interest in the development of central bank digital currencies driven by a wide range of policy motivations. And China is a significant actor in the space, not least because it's years ahead of the world in terms of uh, research and the development of its own central bank digital currency, which is known as digital currency electronic payment or simply DCEP. Our new report sheds light on DCEP's mechanics, its global policy implications, and explains its political and bureaucratic drivers. The aim of this research report is to catalyze and contribute to an informed conversation about what the rollout of DCEP might mean for China and the world. Um, this report consists of several individually authored sections, and I want to first acknowledge the analysts who are unable to join us for the webinar today. Um, Kayla Eisenman is a research uh, analyst at RUSI in London. Uh, Fergus Ryan is an analyst here at ASPE Cyber Center, and Elise Thomas is a researcher here at the Cyber Center. Uh, joining us on the panel today um, are John Gernot, a senior fellow at ASPE and founder of the China advisory uh, firm called Gernot Global. Uh, Dr. Matthew Johnson, who is a research director uh, there with John, and Alex Pasco, who works with me here at ASPE, and Alex focuses on China. Um, we will speak for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have about 30 minutes for Q&A. If you're new to this, using this platform, uh, you'll find on the right-hand side of the screen um, a tab where you can ask questions, and at any point in the webinar, um, you, can, you can input those questions, and we'll do our best to answer as many as possible. Um, with that, I'm going to ask the first question to John. Uh, so John, in this report, we describe how central banks around the world are engaged in the R&D of central bank digital currencies uh, and cited a survey published by the Bank for International Settlements in January 2020 that found that out of uh, 66 central banks, 80% were engaged in the research, experimentation, and development of central bank digital currencies. Um, when so many banks around the world are considering launching a, a central bank digital currency, why should we think about the PRC as a notable actor in this space, and why, why should we care about DCEP? Sure. Thank you, Sam, and thank you for, um, for engaging with this subject. Look, most central banks, most significant central banks around the world are having a good look at, at uh, central bank digital currencies, as you described. Um, you know, what is it? It's at its most simple, it's just digital cash. It's digital cash kept in your digital wallet. wallet. Um, so on one level, it's very straightforward um, and you know, kind of obvious that that's what you would do in the digital age. You think about you know, how to get rid of your wallet, wallets, particularly in this COVID environment where everybody's forgotten their wallets anyway. Now, the the problem that central banks are facing um, is is really the structural problem is what is the purpose? You know, what problem does digital currency solve, um, which is not already um, catered for by, say, your Visa cards or your debit cards or or um, or your other forms of, of cashless transactions? Um, now, the answer to that is not is not straightforward. And also another barrier to most central banks is a digital cash system introduces all sorts of privacy and surveillance concerns, um, which don't apply to cash. I mean, one of the attractions for many people about cash is it's your own and nobody else knows about it. You keep it under your bed and um, you can have cash transactions which um, which authorities can't um, can't use to surveil you and monitor everything that you that you do. Digital currencies pose new monitoring and privacy and confidentiality uh, challenges to central banks. Now, why is China different? Well, uh, partly because the, the answer to those two challenges are very different. What is the problem that a digital currency can solve in China? Um, and that's related to the second part of that, of the, uh, the problem, the challenge for other central banks, and that is, a Chinese digital currency is not necessarily subjected to the same privacy, confidentiality, surveillance concerns 
um, that particularly Western institutions are, are subject to. Flip that around and that can be actually the attraction. So this offers Chinese authorities, and let's start at the first instance with just um, financial authorities, the People's Bank of China. It offers them a mechanism to have much greater visibility over the economy, um, much uh, greater control potentially, um, even over monetary policy, um, uh, money flows, capital count uh, capital controls particularly in, in a um, you know closed capital co account environment such as China's um, there are genuine policy uh, is genuine policy utility that can be advanced if you can set aside the privacy and confidentiality concerns now um, I'm sure we'll build on this but obviously the attraction for financial authorities um, the challenge for the rest of the world will come when what about the other agencies that are involved in China? What's stopping law enforcement or security agencies for having similar designs about the attractiveness of, uh, of digital currencies? I'm just going to um, uh, pause there because, it's, um, because I know we've got a lot through, to go through today. Thanks, John. Um, so Matt, uh, how did DSEP come about and who's behind it? Sure. So, um, as John mentioned uh, just a moment ago, China, like a lot of governments, like a lot of societies, is wrestling with the impact of new financial technologies uh, on society, wrestling with the impact on payments, um, on banking, on economic crime, other really big areas. Uh, for the past several years, decade even, have been gradually um, shaken up by the availability of new financial technology. So what we do know based on the research that we've done that's in this report is that in around 2012, the People's Bank of China, headed by then Governor Zhou Xiaochuan, uh, piloted or began discussing at least the idea of piloting a digital central bank currency to try to regain some control and also gain some capacity and some experience in this financial technology space. And so early days, um, the PBOC had set up a digital currency research institute to address these issues, uh, headed first by Yao Qian and then later uh, by Mu Changchun. These names are both now fairly well known to both central bank digital currency and crypto uh, communities. People have been following these developments very closely. And uh, their approach initially, which I think is quite interesting, was to try to think about central bank currency in terms of the use of blockchain. Um, and there was experimentation for several years, we know, with blockchain. And ultimately, the conclusion was that, sorry, uh, blockchain was not able to um, support the technical demands of DCEP and uh, as a result a new I apologize um, architecture has emerged which is not blockchain based at all and uh, that's where the PBOC is I think as John mentioned the next step is understanding how the other institutions come into it Uh, thanks, Matt. And and I know that uh, one thing that, that you found in, in your chapter was actually that the uh, party's corruption arm uh, is also involved in the development of, of DCEP. And I thought that was quite important in terms of the implications of the surveillance implications, because one thing that we found in, in, in my chapter uh, is that while DCEP assists in normal macroeconomic policy making, looking at the patent information for DCEP, uh, transactions will be fully traceable. Um, in the chapter I wrote, it's noted that the PBOC's primary uh, patent author for DCEP described it as having an anonymous front end and real name back end. Uh, there's an element of anonymity through a characteristic um, called controlled an anonymity, but true anonymity, anonymity does not exist in DCEP um, as currency registration and traceability are, are, are built into the transaction process. Um, now I'd like to move to Alex. Um, Alex, one, one major question we tried to address in the paper is given that Alipay and WeChat Pay have been so successful, um, how could DCEP disrupt that success and what's different about DCEP and these third party payment platforms? Yeah, thanks Sam. Um, there is a similarity between DCEP and 
these third-party payment platforms like Alipay and WeChat Pay in that they'll both be able to be transacted via digital wallets in apps in people's smartphones. But there are a number of key differences um, because DCEP is supposed to function like cash. Um, people won't need an internet connection to transact the digital currency. Um, they can transact between digital wallets that don't necessarily have to be connected to a bank account. Um, another thing is there won't be transaction fees associated with transacting in the digital currency. Um, so those are the main differences. But to go back to the first part of your question about how DCEP could potentially disrupt these two payment platforms, um, there has been a lot of commentary and analysis that says that DCEP is an attempt to wind back the dominance achieved by these two third-party payment providers. Um, it's true they've achieved a tremendous amount of success in a relatively short amount of period, short period of time. Um, collectively, they hold over 90% market share. Uh, over 90% of people in China's largest cities use either Alipay or WeChat Pay as their primary payment method. Um, and this came about largely because of, you know, the government encouraging these two platforms and their associated companies, Tencent and Ant Financial, or spin off, spun off from Alibaba. Um, they received a lot of encouragement, favourable government policies, but given uh, the power they've been able to achieve in a relatively short amount of period of time, we've seen um, the attitude of the central bank sort of shift towards these two platforms and a number of attempts to sort of keep a lid on their dominance. So DCEP could, you know, be seen as a next step in trying to maintain um, or wind back their dominance and encourage other actors in the payment space. So DCEP presents the opportunity for central, uh, sorry, commercial banks, the state-owned commercial banks to um, put forward their own digital wallets and QR code payment methods. Uh, but they definitely face an uphill battle in winding back the level of dominance that Alipay and WeChat Pay have been able to achieve. Thanks, Alex. Uh, so, so Matt, maybe um, we could explain for the audience, what are the knowns and unknowns associated with DCEP? For instance, is how is DCEP already being tested? And um, do you think DCEP will be rolled out across the PRC soon? Sure. So you've addressed the big unknown, which is when is it all going to happen? Um, state media, such as Xinhua, is basically promising that by the 2022 Winter Olympics, DCEP will have reached a new testing level and will be ready for its international debut. So there will be a lot of people looking forward to that moment. Right now in China, DCEP, we are told, is being tested in Shenzhen, in Suzhou, in Xiong'an New Area, and in Chengdu. So four main testing sites. And of those sites, the most news, and it's sort of been trickling out, has been coming from Shenzhen. Uh, so pilots consisting of people being able to use DCEP on a pilot basis, um, not as cash, but in its sort of test form uh, to conduct ordinary everyday transactions. Again, not on a wide scale, but select communities and are, um, select uh, groups of people and most recently, there was uh, a news item saying that people would be eligible for um, sort of DCEP gifts as part of a lottery to get them to use and accept the new currency. That's the testing side. I think there are some much bigger unknowns that we've started to brush up against, such as which institutions will be involved with DCEP. We've mentioned the PBOC. Um, you just alluded to the Central Commission for Discipline Inspection. And from there, we get into much broader issues about privacy and law enforcement and how a digital traceable currency uh, really changes the landscape in terms of how people uh, engage in their everyday behavior when every transaction potentially becomes known. 
So another big unknown there. And I think finally, a third big unknown is to what extent will DCEP potentially replace existing payment platforms like Alipay and WeChat Pay? So what are the implications for shareholders? What are the implications for the private sector in China? To what degree is DCEP an attempt by the party state to regain control over the economy right down to the transaction level? Will it leave space uh, for other payment alternatives, other um, uh, private sector players? Thanks, Matt. Uh, yeah, something that stood out to me in the research for the section that I contributed to the brief was that PBOC Deputy Governor um, explained that full anonymity uh, won't be implemented through DCEP, as I mentioned, uh, in order to discourage crimes like tax evasion, terrorism financing, and money laundering. Uh, DCEP helps to solve legitimate problems, but that problem solving is also a tool for enhancing control. Um, the crime of terrorist financing is defined by the party state as a uh, party state's version of terrorism. Um, and if anybody's been paying attention to recent events, that's uh, quite politically uh, defined uh, and can be directly linked to the PRC's campaign against the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Uh, for instance, in 2020, Australian media reported on a Uyghur woman who has been arrested on charges of terrorist financing for sending money to her parents in Australia who used it to purchase a house. Uh, DCEP doesn't create a process that doesn't already exist, but the technical ability to aggregate bulk user data um, in one place has a future potential to automate ident identification and analysis processes that um, at present are only partly automated, uh, for instance, to help translate, uh, um, to, um, sorry, I lost track of what I was saying, um, uh, to, to help trace money transfers through different uh, entities and different levels. Um, so something to consider if DCEP is successful um, in, in rolling out and adopted um, is that the world would have to be prepared to contend with a PRC um, possession of information that would allow it to enforce its definition of activities um, that it's monitoring anti-corruption and anti-terrorism globally. And that potentially um, allows PRC standards and definitions of illegality beyond its borders to be implemented with greater effectiveness. So with that, John, um, I'm wondering if you could, given those political uh, implications, how do you think the PRC's effort to build a central bank digital currency will affect the party's ability to affect, uh, to exercise its power both domestically and globally, if it is in fact successful? Look, that's the that's the uh, the trillion dollar question, and. Look, before answering, you know, I want to put a couple of clear caveats that this has not been launched. Nobody knows if the technology or the infrastructure really works. Um, from what we can see from um, uh, from the uh, responses that we can see through the, uh, you know, a fairly um, cult tailored um, information environment, the consumer experience has been underwhelming at best. Why would you take DCEP when you've got a perfectly workable, convenient Alipay app on your phone or WeChat Pay app on your on your phone. So the basic problem of does it work, will it roll out successfully, and why would you choose to use it if you didn't have to, um, means that it may not be up and running as quickly as people say. That said, China has a unique capability to make this thing work if the party state decides that it should. At the moment, um, through, including through the involvement of some of the agencies that have been mentioned, um, Matt earlier and you, Sam, there does seem to be very high level and powerful backing for this project. We know that the Chinese party state is uniquely capable of using all sorts of levers, um, incentives, disincentives to guide people to make choices um, that it wants them to make. Um, and at bottom, it can compel people to use DCEP. If you're a government employee and you're offered to, to receive DCEP tokens or nothing, you choose the DCEP um, tokens. The question will be how far can this extend? If you're a foreign investor and you want to repatriate your, your, um, your dollars after selling shares on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange a few years from now, uh, what if you have to take your returns in DCEP? Uh, in order to get it out of the country. Maybe you take it. Do you do you automatically then have an international, to some extent, currency in the making? 
So China's unique powers of persuasion, and in some cases compulsion, means that we have to factor in the possibility that this could be very real, that this could have enormous take up um, in China, and that that take up will naturally spill across China's borders, first of all, with, with students, tourists, um, Chinese businesses, um, for, you know, uh, most importantly, in in diaspora communities and you know intra uh, you know involve um, transactions involving people who have um, a stake in the Chinese economy, but then it could potentially spread. Now, what has been described in including an authoritative text, we've, which we've looked at closely in this in this report, is the People's Bank of China is making no bones about what they are building. They are building the world's potentially largest collection of personal data. Full stop. Uh, not only that, there is explicit. Um, uh, built into the design explicitly is a big data analytical capability. So um, subject to the caveats of will it all work and will people use it? If they do, if it does go to plan, you have the world's most sophisticated information mining capability, potentially rolled out over, what, a billion consumers in China and, and maybe uh, hundreds of millions of more people um, around the world. Now, if you have somebody's total financial data, all of their financial transactions, including all of those that would normally done, be done by cash in a previous world, and you have their location data, there's probably very little that you cannot potentially learn about this person. So what we're talking about, and this is potential, this is speculative, but conceivably the world's most comprehensive uh, surveillance capability, the most comprehensive surveillance capability uh, that, that history has so far conceived. Thank you, John. Um, and Alex, one question that we had is, is um, how will DCEP leverage Alipay and WeChat Pay and, and specifically how do you think they'll fit into the structural rollout of DCEP or will they at all? Yeah, so the short answer is we don't know at the moment. I guess it's it's still unclear as to whether Alipay and WeChat Pay will be included in the the second tier of the DCEP structure, so the, the group of financial institutions below the central bank that will be issued with DCEP and have the capability for their users to transact in the digital currency. Um, but something that Fergus and I looked at in our chapter were some patent applications filed by Ant Financial and Tencent. Um, both those firms have also established their own digital currency research institutes. So it does appear as though they are, you know, looking to engage in this system. And it seems almost infeasible that they wouldn't be included. Um, as John mentioned, they have a massive user base and these users are highly unlikely to switch to another digital wallet that barely differs from the one that they currently use. Um, particularly in the case of WeChat Pay, that is a digital wallet that is integrated into the WeChat app, which serves a whole bunch of other functions, very relevant and convenient to people's daily lives. So WeChat Pay and Alipay could definitely be leveraged by the central bank if they wanted to achieve wide scale uptake and use of the digital currency. Um, I think something that's also, we also mentioned in our chapter is the technology that these firms have at their disposal. Um, the transaction processing requirement for DCEP to be successful is very high. And I think Alibaba is currently the only known company that has demonstrated the transaction processing requirement. So it's it'll be interesting to see if there's any cooperation going on between there to to, to make DCEP successful. Definitely, thank you, thank you, Alex. Um, so Matt, I wanna just go into a little bit more detail, you know, why is it that we should care about the politics behind DCEP's rollout and, and in general, why do you think it's significant that the party's anti-corruption body is helping to shape DCEP? Well, the answer to that is obviously gonna depend on where you sit. Um, I think what we can say broadly is that China right now is in terms of what the Communist Party's policies are, trying to re-inject financial stability into the economy, not just through DCEP, but in a wide range of areas and using a wide range of technologies. And so the role that DCEP might play in strengthening uh, party control over the economy, over uh, financial flows, over the behavior of institutions, then obviously becomes very relevant 
in this kind of a context. And as John mentioned, uh, in this context, DCEP then is basically another tool of leverage. So um, politically, that can go a lot of different ways. If you're an institution uh, that is in the good graces of the Communist Party operating within China, then DCEP is just another layer to your transactions. Um, but if you are a bank in Hong Kong uh, whose political loyalty is questionable, uh, and, and there have been a couple of incidences of this recently, then suddenly DCEP is a tool that can be used to look into your transactions, control your accounts, and uh, change your behavior. So the big question is, how is the Communist Party going to use DCEP to uh, create, I think, a new financial infrastructure starting in China and moving outward toward the rest of the world? And to what degree is that infrastructure going to reflect uh, what we know about the Communist Party's operating procedures, its political ideology, and how its different institutions work in concert to achieve specific ends. The jury is obviously out because we're not close to a national rollout of DCEP yet. Uh, but on the other hand, as, was, as, as you mentioned, Sam, at the very beginning of uh, the discussion, China is ahead. No other country is working as hard on this problem as China is. And so uh, at the, the largest, you know, the, the sort of most scaled up macro level, uh, it's a question about whether the technology that's being developed in China right now is going to go global, is going to be the preferred solution of other governments around the world, and is going to bring all of those same features uh, that are being developed in China into other societies. It's a very interesting and, in a sense, very fragile time, I think, for the global financial economy. You've got massive technological change, and governments are trying to get in position to harness this change. And then, you know, the, the ideology and the um, institutions and the vision at, at, at a, a global scale that those governments have is suddenly going to have a big impact on how new financial technologies like DCEP are deployed. Thanks, Matt. Um, John, uh, Kayla Eisenman, who, who wrote the section in this report on, um, on uh, internationalization, focused on internationalization and future impl uh, implications, she said DCEP offers an opportunity uh, to move away from the SWIFT system as it appears that DCEP would have the same messaging capabilities that SWIFT and SIPs provide, but it would remove the need for intermedi intermediaries. Uh, DCEP, therefore, as she said, could serve as a messaging system that allows uh, for sanctions evasion. She also talked about the potential for DCEP to support internationalization of the RMB. Um, so what are your thoughts on this? And I'm interested, and I see a question um, uh, in the Q&A here uh, that is related to this and, and your thoughts on the global implications that DCEP might have and more importantly, what liberal democracies can do to mitigate any risks associated with its potentially successful rollout. I think you're on mute, John. A, uh, a beginner's trick. One of the you know, really most interesting questions is, whether DCEP will enable what many, which some senior officials, mainly retired officials, I should say, in, in China have been championing, and that is, will DCEP offer a vehicle to get around, to escape from uh, the US financial system and all the surveillance and long arm law enforcement capability that that brings? sanctions regime being um, the most obvious manifest manifestation of that. So potentially it does. Potentially this provides an opportunity to at least create puncture holes in the US financial system. Um, it provides uh, shelter for, certainly for China-related entities, but um, in your question, what opportunities might it provide for other countries that are interested in evading US financial system surveillance and law enforcement. Um, what will it offer a country like North Korea, which is already using all sorts of devices um, from cryptocurrency speculation to, um, to a lot of barter trading in the middle of the night to avoid using US 
dollars in a transaction, could this possibly be um, an attractive alternative to a nation such as North Korea or even Venezuela, which is now experimenting with, with uh, petrodollars? So if you're already using a very suboptimal alternative to the US financial system, maybe DCEP becomes um, comparatively uh, attractive, particularly if you can imagine, as you can imagine, China could throw in a whole bunch of sweetness to encourage a nation to use it. So I think this is a very real possibility, still many years away, but a very real possibility. Um, there's other ways in which, in which uh, DCEP could be exported. You can imagine having, you know, maybe it's not an RMB DCEP, but the same technology stack built on existing technology that, that Chinese providers are already providing throughout Southeast Asia, for example. You can imagine a democratic or a quasi-democratic state, you know, maybe it wants a, um, its own surveillance capability um, and just piggybacks on Chinese technology and infrastructure and know-how. That's possible. What will it mean for liberal democracies and for the, the very now long and deep recession in a uh, democracy recession that we're seeing throughout the world. Well, you know, at face value, this is just another tool, another boon for, for dictatorship. Um, what should the world do about it? Now, that's a much more complex question. I think we're at a very, very early stage of this conversation. And if there's anything we've learned from, um, you know, recent efforts to push back against some of the sharper edges of Chinese technology and its export throughout the world, it's before you, um, it would be nice to have spent some time actually understanding what this thing is and building some sort of universal framework which can um, be broad enough and strong enough to apply to digital currency regimes wherever they come from. Um, but I think essentially the principle should be that no matter, you know, for the world, for de democracies, no matter where, which party state is backing this currency, you've got to abide by local conditions and local rules and local norms. Um, and I imagine that this agenda may be driven by some law enforcement agencies. You can imagine what the US um, tax authorities um, or money laundering authorities might think if they had no access um, and no cooperation from DCEP denominated uh, financial ecosystems that might, might be um, uh, facilitating important, sometimes illegal transactions in the United States. Thank you, John. Um, you know, be, based on my research for the chapter, one additional piece of advice that I had um, uh, for is, is that for DCEP to be successful, um, liberal democracies should establish laws um, or to help sort of mitigate um, the risks associated with its success, uh, is that liberal democracies should establish laws on data privacy and protection. Uh, DCEP can't really be stopped, but the harmful impacts on our societies could be mitigated and at the very least um, liberal democracy should you know, figure out ways to uh, to regulate the ways that any entity um, can collect and use individual data and um, improve oversight and improve due diligence aimed at mitigating data security risks. And I think that's actually in response to one of the questions that I, that I see here on the side, which we'll get to in just a minute. I wanna ask Alex one more question. Uh, you know, thinking long-term, how will center and how will users be incentivized to use, um, uh, to use DCEP? Um, and projecting further into the future, if the US government has recently signaled that it might place restrictions on financial intensity, um, and if this happened, how might it impact any global uptake of DCEP? Um, and in any case, do you think users globally could be incentivized to use DCEP? Um, uh, yeah, no, it's an interesting question. Um, I think we've already sort of touched on uh, the ways that oh, there are means at the central bank's disposal to encourage the use of DCEP outside of WeChat Pay and Alipay. So things like issuing salaries in DCEP, uh, providing travel subsidies in DCEP, um, and Matt mentioned the, the national lottery sort of distributing DCEP to people to encourage them to use it. Um, but again, going back to what I mentioned before, it, it, it seems like a difficult task to encourage people to, to stray beyond Alipay and WeChat Pay. Um, internationally, we this isn't something we focused on too much in our chapter because discussions we were having seemed to point to the fact that this is a domestically focused project, at least at the moment. Um, and so internationalization via 
you know, the greater circulation of DCEP overseas is probably something that's very far down the track. But um, in our research, we did sort of come across this idea that Alipay and WeChat Pay offer a means for the digital currency to be circulating overseas through um, Chinese tourists, Chinese students, um, diaspora communities. And um, Alibaba and Tencent have uh, both been signing agreements with merchants all over the world to provide them access to um, their payment platforms. Um, but uh, the point you made about potential restrictions being placed on these companies overseas and obviously TikTok and WeChat are prime examples of how much scrutiny these Chinese social media apps are coming under at the moment. Um, even if WeChat Pay functionality were to be rolled out for international users, it seems that uh, it's, it'd be quite a difficult barrier to overcome these concerns around um, data privacy that people have. Um, I think I'm completely losing my train of thought, but yeah, international uptake of DCEP is also, it also relates to, um, you know, how well established user preferences are. And so in Western um, established economies, we found that um, payment preferences are relatively well established. People use credit cards and debit cards. Uh, we've also been pretty late to the party on mobile and digitized payments through things like Apple Pay. Uh, so there are perhaps greater opportunities in developing economies where payment preferences aren't yet so well established. And I think Southeast Asia is also um, referred to as a potential opportunity given the higher rates of um, mobile payments usage there. Thank you, Alex. So I'll start moving to the uh, Q&A. Um, we have quite a few questions in here already, but I encourage you to, um, to in, on the right-hand side of, of your screen, you should be able to type in a question um, and I'll try to get to as many as I can. Uh, so the first one here is actually, a, a, I've got a fairly quick answer to why why was blockchain inadequate for, for DCEP? And it's actually just that it um, it's not fast enough. The example that we saw uh, was the equivalent, the sort of the Chinese equivalent of a Cyber Monday. Uh, so it can't process transaction fast enough is, is, is the answer to that question. Uh, so, the next question that I see here is, um, could DCEP kill the Chinese shadow banking sector? And I think, Matt, that's probably a question that you'd be happy to answer. If not, maybe John. <laughs> well, we, we could we could relay back and forth, but um, I think uh, just to start, if China's government were interested in killing off the shadow banking sector, then it's possible that uh, total surveillance of transactions and economic flows would be a very powerful tool uh, in that process. Now, I want to equivocate a bit and say that um, I don't necessarily think that by financial stability, uh, China's leaders yet mean placing the entire economy under direct party control because there's a certain amount of vibrancy that the country's economy clearly derives from the private sector and from um, a certain level of individual and firm choice. But nonetheless, DCEP would be an important piece in the fence or the cage, so to speak, around individual and firm behavior. And so if we're talking about the shadow banking sector and China's regulators, China's regulators really want to step in, uh, then obviously uh, DCEP can play some role in that. But it's not a magic bullet necessarily or a, a silver bullet. It's um, part of a broader policy toolbox that we can imagine in the future um, might be used to uh, gain more control over what sometimes feels like a very precarious economy and other times is represented at least externally as a uh, smoothly operating machine. But John may have a take as well. <laughs> um, so I'll go to the next question here. Um, and I see it has a couple of upvotes. Is there any indication uh, that DCEP will be tied to the social credit system, particularly in dealing with taxation? Um, 
is something that in my chapter I, I looked at a little bit, but then decided to um, wait and, and spend some more time in, in future research looking into what the exact link would be. One thing I'll say is that, um, and I won't go into social credit too much because that's, that's a topic on its own, uh, but it's that it wouldn't be that a transaction would feed directly into a like score or something like that and then you know, causing scores to go up and down. That's not what it would be based on my understanding, but uh, it's uh, possible that the data linked to um, uh, tr uh, transaction data would be fed into other, um, uh, combined, combined with other data to, to help make decisions related to um, maybe credit worthiness, uh, of course, but I think that's an area for further research. So I'll, I'll maybe just, um, say that I'll, I'll try to comment on that uh, later. Um, maybe I'll, I'll write something later down the track. Um, and let's see, I'm just a little bit lost in the Q&A. The next one uh, I think we addressed already is, is what, what does John see as a way forward? Um, so I'll put, I'll put the next two questions together and uh, I think Mamba, uh, John and Matt are the correct two people to answer these questions. Um, so is China attempting to bypass the dominance of the US dollar and uh, central bank uh, swap arrangements? And then also we have a question, uh, how much is DCEP a reaction to cryptocurrency and stable coin projects? And uh, how concerned is the PBOC about other virtual assets? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I'm not sure I'll be correct, but happy to have a stab at those. Look, we, we talked a bit about the US financial system earlier. Um, and just to to underscore that, yes, this is at least unofficially um, providing shelter from the US financial system is indeed um, said to be a motivation or at least a hope behind, D, uh, behind DCEP in some quarters. On the specific question of um, of cryptocurrencies and other, you know, has, has to, to what extent is DCEP being motivated by um, alternative currencies? Very clearly, one of the purposes of DCEP is it can displace and replace cryptocurrencies. There's nothing that, uh, well, governments anywhere, let alone uh, the Chinese party state, appreciates about a cryptocurrency's ability to provide anonymized, decentralized, and foreign controlled. Uh, financial transactions in a country. So, so um, uh, China has these guys operating kind of, you know, on borrowed time anyway, and DCEP could, if they wanted to, complete the process of squeezing them out of, um, of China. It is, you know, recently there has been some strong quasi-official senior former officials um, talking about the motivation provided by Facebook's Libra, um, Facebook-backed Libra project. And so that's certainly in the discourse. Um, it does seem that the Facebook-backed Libra project has catalyzed a, sort, a certain competitive response um, from China. And at the very least, um, Beijing wants to make sure that it gets there first. Matt, do you have anything to add? No. Okay, uh, so let's see where we are in the Q and A. Um, so the next question is: Is will it not come down to fees? DCEP will probably be free, and thereby we will uh, we'll see a migration from fee charging platforms of Alipay and Tencent. Um, I don't know if Alex or, or John and Matt. Alex, do you want to? Could have a go. Um, yes, so I think that's one of the, the ways that the PBOC will try to incentivize people to use DCEP, but I do still think it comes back to how integrated these payment platforms already are in people's lives. I don't know about you, but personally, I don't think about fees particularly when I'm transacting just on an everyday level, um, but it, it would be interesting to see how it plays out, whether that is a primary concern for Chinese consumers. Um, so the next question here, um, sort of a broader question is, is there evidence that China's population feels uncomfortable at all with the level of data the government has on it? Um, I certainly think that there is, um, I won't spend too much time on this question, but I, th I think that there is a, a concern about privacy risks, for instance, but I think also when we think about the ways that the party state is using technology and um, in order to augment its authoritarianism. Uh, a lot of what's happening isn't fundamentally new in terms of the actual processes. And that's something about DCEP uh, that, um, you know, it's not necessarily true that DCEP's uh, surveillance um, 
is a new it's a new concept. It's more that it's new technology, better enabling uh, what uh, what the sort of intent already was. Um, sorry, I lost track of what I was saying. And uh, and so I think that yeah, there is uh, some discomfort, but in one in one way, um, the concepts aren't new. The technology is, and then in another, um, you know, even if people are concerned, um, things like privacy, for instance, that protection stops where the party's power begins. So I don't know that that really would change very much. Um, and then I think also, if you look at this question globally, I mean, I've oftentimes I'm asked this question about China specifically, but globally, I don't know how much uh, general sort of populations care about uh, privacy risk, because there's a lot of news stories in recent years about um, about the risks associated with, with uh, bulk data collection, but then I think it's hard for individuals to imagine why they should care. And so I think governments and uh, civil society should do better at explaining why people should care in general. Um, uh, that's just, you know, an opinion, but I'll sort of go back to more specific questions on DCEP now. Uh, so Patrick Kennedy asks, uh, what are the cybersecurity and critical infrastructure risks that might be lowered or heightened in a move to digital cash? Um, I think maybe, uh, you know, that's I, I feel like it's my turn. I feel like yeah. it might be my Yeah. <laughs> so to go to the sources here, obviously China's government is deeply concerned with protecting its own data at a national level. And I think Chinese citizens are concerned. There was a, a, an editorial that appeared recently in Caixin Journal um, expressing at least some concern about uh, personal data and what DCEP means for personal data. So across the board, I think smart, informed people from government all the way down to society see increased risk as data becomes more concentrated and more and more human behavior is uh, digitized as data. In terms of steps that China is um, specifically taking to protect data in the course of constructing DCEP, now we're still learning or trying to learn about the architecture. Uh, players like Huawei definitely seem to be involved. Um, so there's a strong uh, you know, sort of state national champion role um, here for firms that can uh, help China's government create this new infrastructure, this new secure infrastructure that's needed to launch a system of this scale. So I guess short answer is everybody's aware of the risks and um, as DCEP evolves, we can certainly see signs that China's government is taking steps to protect data, uh, both through, through law and through actual um, infrastructure. But it makes a proposition like this incredibly risky, right? As soon as you digitize your national transactions, uh, you know, as, as soon as you move your money, your M0 to the digital space, then you are opening yourself up uh, for um, risks, especially if you insist on having one centralized payment system. So, so for China, that may make the stakes actually even higher. Thanks, Matt. And I think this last question here, um, Alex, uh, any indication that um, the PRC will simply mandate um, Alipay and WeChat Pay migrate to use of DCIP? Um, I'm not sure. I don't think there has been any strong indication from um, the PBOC about exactly what role Alipay and WeChat Pay will play. Um, but to just um, piggyback off something that Matt was talking about. Something that Fergus and I referenced in our chapter was a statement from uh, the head of the PBOC's Digital Currency Research Institute who um, attempted to sort of highlight the superior security of DSET, particularly sort of in contrast to Alipay and WeChat Pay. And so Fergus and I sort of read that as an attempt to um, instill a greater sense of trust in the security of DCEP that is backed by the central bank, uh, as opposed to the money that might be held in digital wallets like Alipay and WeChat Pay. So obviously it remains to be seen whether they'll be able to make sure it's 100% secure, but I think, yeah, we've definitely seen attempts that 
they are trying to put forward that narrative. Thanks, Alex. So I see we have a couple more questions that came through here. So I'll respond to these and then I'll uh, have a final question for all the um, panelists to, to respond to. Um, so one question here is to what extent does this indicate that the uh, People's Bank of China is already involved in digital payment infrastructure and does it show that adoption may be easier than initially assumed? And then another question here is what impact would DCEP have on money supply? Um, oh, sorry, and I think that first question, there was a um, statement before it recently on, um, it was announced that due to banking, software upgrades on the government side, digital payments on all platforms would be suspended during upgrades. So the question, um, the first question I, I gave was probably linked to that. Um, Matt and John? Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna duck the, um, the money supply question but to to just to reinforce the uh, the premise of that last question and that is the technology really matters this is not straightforward to build a national um, reliable single technology for all electronic payments you know to for this for the potential for this uh, for the whole financial system to go down with you know for a soft grade upgrade software upgrade in you know, that's reason alone to be very very cautious in your in the timelines and the rollout of um, of this proposition. Um, money supply. Matt, I can jump on money supply real quick. Um, again, going by the sources, uh, People's Bank of China authorities have been very clear that. Um, smart contracts and other blockchain uh, type um, innovations will not um, be part of DCEP in the sense that uh, there won't be futures trading, for example, that could impact uh, the value of um, China's money, uh, China's currency via DCEP. But what they're saying, which is very interesting, um, is that DCEP could be used in a sense for smart targeting of stimulus to specific regions, institutions, even individuals. And so in that sense, um, one could imagine, and, and this is how DCEP is being uh, touted by bank officials, DCEP representing an innovation in the sense that it allows for uh, smarter interventions into the economy uh, rather than you know the kind of massive flooding that we know that uh, China's banking officials are very keen to avoid, especially in this financial moment. So it's being sort of touted as like a, a technology that is the right technology for a particularly risky and fragile economic time that gives the PBOC a new tool to stimulate the economy uh, without having outsized impact on the money supply and you know creating too much slush but on the other hand uh you know that that remains to be tested and and proven this is part of uh the aura around DCEP that the government is putting forward though certainly thank you matt so we have a just a few more minutes left and i wanted to ask each of the panelists for for closing comments and i have one last last one last question for all of you is uh what do you think the questions are that we haven't been able to address in this research that analysts should prioritize when researching DCEP um, moving forward? And I'd like to start, John, with you. Oh, I was hoping to go last. Um, the Look, I think that this is just another opportunity after we've missed all the others to think ahead and to, to um, for all of our respective nations to think, what do we think about this emerging technology before it has emerged and um, enmeshed itself in the global infrastructure? If there are potentialities with this technology that we're nervous about, then um, what sort of system can, uh, are we going to deploy to be able to enforce our various national community rules and norms and, and principles? And this is um, not just a question of, of, of law, it's not just a question of, of institutions and norms, um, it's also a question of leverage. And I think at its base, what DCEP offers is a tool of leverage. And if we think about it in those terms, um, then that's actually a, 
you know, a, a, at least a key to thinking about practical responses to this technology, opportunity and challenge. Thank you, John. Um, Alex. Um, this is a bit of a tricky one, I think, obviously, because the focus of our chapter was limited to things like Alipay and WeChat Pay. Um, it's hard to immediately recognise the relevance if you're overseas, particularly in a Western liberal democracy where you might not even use any of these platforms. Uh, but I think it'll be interesting to keep tracking, obviously, whether DCEP can be successful domestically and the implications internationally for sort of social media users and the need for, this is something that you, Sam, you touched on before, but um, individuals to have a greater awareness about those data privacy issues. And yeah, hopefully governments and civil society can do a better job at that going forward. Thank you, Alex. And finally, Matt. Well, we had discussed beforehand what it means for research that, uh, you know, somewhere during the course of writing this report, we were able to link DCEP to the Central Commission for Discipline Inspection, uh, which is sort of there in the background, but not there in the foreground. And so it's not necessarily an answer or a, a, a posing of an, un an unanswered question, but I would say that if we want to understand these big systemic projects that China's government is rolling out and that increasingly other governments will be rolling out around the world, then we need to have the research capability uh, to help us to understand who is speaking about projects like DCEP, because that was really a, a big clue in writing this report, and it's right there in the report. At first, it's the PBOC who is, you know, ch and, and, and its officials who are championing DCEP. But then later, as you peel that back a bit and look at where the statements are coming from, you start to see other players, other institutions creeping in. But again, you wouldn't see that without the language ability, without the sort of knowledge of the political system, and without a kind of intuition uh, about how politics and, and hierarchies and relations between bureaucracies in China actually work. And so I know this is kind of a, a theme of the moment, but I think it's a very good theme, which is that as systems um, grow and diverge simultaneously, uh, we, we need the research ability in multiple languages across multiple uh, political systems that will allow us to keep up. Uh, thank you so much, Matt, and uh, to John and Alex as well for, for an excellent discussion today. And thank you um, to everybody who's, who's joined online. Um, so I'd like to encourage you uh, to download the reports on our website, aspie.org.au. Um, it's available both to read online and you can download a PDF copy. Um, and then also, uh, if you want to keep up with the date, it's up to date with the work that the Cyber Center is doing, I recommend that you um, subscribe to our daily daily Cyber um, Digest, which I believe you can also access um, a link to uh, via, via our website. Uh, with that, thank you so much, and I hope everybody has a great uh, morning or afternoon uh, wherever you're based. Thank you. Thank you.